Welcome back to the French Rugby Podcast with me, Tim Groves, ex-Scotland international and adopted Frenchman, Johnny BT. And we're going to be joined by former England and Toulouse fly half Toby Flood to discuss one of the darkest days England have had, but one of the best results ever from a French perspective. Johnny, where do we start at Twickenham with what we witnessed? France's best ever performance in any game, just in the tournament? I mean, definitely in the Six Nations era, right? Oh, 100%. Um, and I think given the context and who they were playing against, it meant even more. But it's been rare to see that complete a performance from a French side. We've seen it, you know, in fits and starts, especially the start of Fabian Galtier and Sean Edwards coming in. We've seen it. But to see it on that stage with everything on the line against one of their oldest enemies in La Crunch, where they hadn't won since, we talked about it last week, um, since Dimitri Yashvili and his generation um absolutely incredible in terms of the comprehensive nature of that performance the capitulation by england as well which we'll get on to but um the pleasure you could see the boys on the field taking in that victory the manner of their win how they went about it the smiles on their faces some of the tries they ran in um and the general effort it was absolutely outstanding certainly the best i can remember and you're talking wider French rugby public, neighbours, people around the corner talking about it, the smiles on people's faces, the energy that game has given everyone. Um, I can't remember another one like it in the 10 old years that I've been over here in France. It was absolutely superb. In terms of the other games that might be up there, obviously everyone speaks about the 1999 World Cup yeah. semi-final. Yeah. There's the massive win at Wembley over Wales, 51-0, I think it was, in the late 90s. There was also a final round game that you played, I think, where they absolutely smashed Scotland and had to Stop win by it. a certain number of points Stop to, it. to win the title. <laughs> Basically, what I'm saying, Johnny, is that would have been the best, but this has eclipsed it now, surely. Oh, yeah, but that's Scotland and it's Wales. Like you, you, mm. it's, you know, it's the biggest game. It's England, it's the crunch, and it's in the professional era. We're talking about 90s. It's not really the same. Uh, Scotland and Myra is definitely not the same because we were dreadful, but, you know... French rugby in the professional era, modern day rugby where teams are hard to break down. You're playing in some of the best players in the world, England, who are a World Cup winning nation. They're absolutely massive. Like they're a beast of a country and they're the oldest enemy. You know, Matt Hansen's been everywhere in the press this week. Everyone loves playing against England and everyone loves beating England. So to do it like that, that'd be the record score. Even at half time, you could see them going down the tunnel, not knowing, but sort of understanding that they just beating England in the best first half performance ever. That was the record defeat for England at half time. And then to go out and do it again in the second half and humiliate them. Um, look, for, for me, it's, it's by miles. There is this sort of historic element and the, the mystery around Dominici and 99 and these games. But that one ultimately will go down as the best game and the biggest victory in the professional era uh, for France. You mentioned that it's England. Clearly that's massive for any France side. We spoke about the fact they hadn't won at Twickenham since 2005 last week. Mm -hmm. That obviously did give them that kind of extra motivation that maybe they hadn't had in the first couple of rounds when they'd been kind of finding their feet. They refound themselves. And afterwards, it was interesting that Fabien Galtier was visibly emotional, wasn't he? Yeah, special for that. But you could see the reaction of the coaching box when they scored their seventh try at Twickenham. They realised they'd notched up 50 points. You could see how much it meant to them as a coaching staff, as a group. Um, but like essentially rugby is a human adventure, right? You're taking people along for a ride, getting buy-in and trying to do something exceptional. And that was their message all last week was that we're going to Twickenham. We haven't won here. Can we create something and a memory that will be phenomenal? And can we do something that's maybe not expected because it hasn't happened since 2005? And not only did they do it, they did it with a manner that was outrageous. And that's where the emotion comes in is that Yes, you can be expecting a win or the, the hard graft that you put in as a coaching staff or a group of players, but it's very rare, and I think they'll all understand this, it's very, very rare that everything comes together perfectly like it did against one of the biggest rugby nations that we've ever seen. Um, so I completely understand the knowing Fabian from our time at Montpellier is a guy that can get emotional and does show that side, uses that as motivation as well in team talks, like ha happily um, happy with outpouring in his emotions. Um, and so it was great. It was great to see. It was great to see the ecstatic nature of the celebrations afterwards from the coaching box. Amazing also to your Antoine Dupont and the players, you know, re reference it already as 
you know, in 15, 20, 25 years, we cannot wait to sit down and have a beer and look back and talk about this game because it doesn't happen every weekend. These types of games don't happen to every single professional rugby player and they don't always happen on the biggest stage. So for it to have happened, phenomenal for them, delighted for them. And we talked before about how it been fits and starts their performance bit part, not quite convincing, but they've been dominant in the 24 years up to this. So for it to come together at Twickenham for them to notch up a rock record score, um, it's just something that will maybe never happen again to any of these players. So it's incredibly special. They should cherish it, hold on to it. And quite rightly, it's a massive celebration of the game because it was just insane. We'll get into some of the detail about the breakdown, the exits, all kinds of stuff when Toby comes on. But on that emotion, was there any part of that that was other people externally questioning Fabian and this front side over the opening few rounds, especially after what they'd done last year when they were incredible was there any of that coming out of it or was it just that occasion and that performance that it was almost like he was overjoyed by it and it was an outpouring of emotion well i think internally he he will have he'll quietly be working away believing in what he's doing but that was a validation of excellence that's what that was that wasn't a you know is this or isn't it a great french team they had been up until this tournament you got the elements of fatigue that played in everyone's mind. They put everyone on a week's holiday. We mentioned that they were all given a week's holiday, go back and just chill, do nothing, and then come back and perform. And that's exactly what they did. So I don't think they'll worry. I think it's interesting as well, the shift in perception of this French team and the sort of French media wider criticism and, oh, do we know how to play now? They're still winning, you know, but yeah. they're, they're used to something now that they haven't been used to for 15, 20 years, which is a dominant, exciting, vibrant performance every single week. And that's what they delivered. Um, and I think we've said it all, but I just, I, 50 points at Twickenham. Like, it just doesn't happen. Um, and it didn't happen for Fabian in his playing days. So he's been through it. And I think as you get older, you also get wiser and a bit more philosophical. And he'll realize how special this is. So the emotion, I completely understand. Um, the performance, absolutely complete. We can dissect it with uh, Toby when he joins us. Um, but one of the best days for the French rugby side. It was absolutely ridiculous. You mentioned the rest last week. And that was an interesting insight because a lot of people in the English media didn't pick up on that at all. You can't do that every week. But was it almost a perfect storm? Because you've kind of got a happy squad who are coming off the back of a bit of time with their mates and a slightly lighter load, obviously against an England team that had probably been worked quite hard and and you know been in camp for a couple of weeks and and are struggling. So it, sometimes in sport, professional, modern sport, you can kind of be overly scientific, but off the back of a week like that, you get players playing with freedom and expressing themselves. But well, I think you you hit the nail on the head with a perfect storm in the in the twenty years previous, the players wouldn't have had the week off because the FFR wouldn't have had the control. So mm. they'd have been back to their clubs, they'd have been playing, um, they'd have been a fallow week, um, and they wouldn't have had the holiday. So that is the control. When you look at the different teams and player numbers, participation rates, you look at Ireland, who've got a model that suits them down to the ground, number one in the world. France now number two in the world, a much more collaborative environment with the top 14 clubs. And that week off was critical because if they hadn't and they'd been sent back to clubs and they'd be butchered, they wouldn't have been able to perform with that freshness at that time. And like you said, that's not going to happen every single week, but it was required, it was absolutely needed, and it was critical to this performance in that they, if they hadn't had it, where would they have been physically? We don't know. But that just shows you again when as a federation or as a national team, you get a little bit more control and you get a feeling or a, a sense and you can really put your finger on the pulse when you're monitoring the players, you can act accordingly. And that was absolutely what was required. And not many teams, I don't think we do that. Not many coaches also have the maturity to give people a complete rest period. Um, but I think, you know, Greg with his performance and the way he stormed back and um, the freshness shown by the pack, which we'll get into individuals, but look, one to 23, uh, they were excited. They were settled their systems work and they had that freshness and they blitzed England off the field. So um, look, it absolutely worked. It was a perfect storm. Right. We'll bring Toby on in a minute, but I'm guessing your meter moment of the week might just have come from Twickenham, Johnny. So let's find out what it is. Uh, well, I don't really know what individual bit to go into. There's no <laughs> just element. All of it. I'm gonna, well, just like the whole thing. Um, 
5310 record score at Twickenham. Um happiness. I mean restore to everyone. Um but I don't know where you start. Scrum they absolutely blitzed them, collisions at the breakdown, beasted them, collisions in the midfield, beasted them, settled in their structures. They were exciting. They pushed the ball to space. They challenged England. The kicking game. I mean, essentially every single element of the game, they won. Um, so, And the result was 53-10 and a record score. So for Fabian, for Antoine Dupont, for Greg, for all of these guys that were part of it, um, and I would say generally in rugby, that was the meter moment of the weekend globally was France absolutely demolishing England at Twickenham. So well done to them. Enjoy it. There's a meat thermometer on your way, every single one of you, the 23 <laughs> and Fabien. Um, but absolutely, the meat thermometer of the weekend was France at the weekend bulldozing England at Twickenham. Phenomenal to watch. Yeah, as far as meter moments of the week go, probably the least surprising ever, but there you go. Easy, <laughs> easy. easy. <laughs> that was Johnny's meter moment of the week and meter is the world's number one wireless meat thermometer, recently making over 20 million cooks better with their game-changing app and completely wireless Bluetooth meat probe. You can use it on a barbecue, in the oven or in a pan and you can get your hands on one at meter.com. Plus, you can get 10% off any full price item. All you have to do is enter the code FRENCHPOD10 at checkout. That's FRENCHPOD10 and you'll get 10% off any full price item at meter.com. Let's get our guest on now then, and we can get his view on the game, where England go from here, whether France are going to win the World Cup, and chat a little bit about his Toulouse days as well. Former England fly half, Toby Flood joins us. How are you doing? Yeah, not too bad, thank you. How are you? We're good. You were at Twickenham on Saturday? I don't remember being there, actually. No, I don't remember <laughs> being there, actually. So it was, it was like a four-hour window where I just don't remember anything. Yeah, I was there, sadly. I say sadly, it was pretty impressive to watch the French play. Um, obviously, as an England fan, it's difficult to watch, but... But they um they were they were very good. Mate, we watched the Scotland game together, the Calcutta mm. Cup game, and bits of that were difficult to watch. We talked about the atmosphere, the lack of it, the fact that it was difficult for the English players. This week more difficult, like record score at Twickenham. We'll talk about the French side in a minute. Let's focus on England. What are you making of what you're seeing right now? Yeah, I think England find themselves in a really weird situation where you know, take, for instance, the headline stuff, which is like Fowler and Smith and all those conversations. I think that the, the performance on the weekend, and, and you could even take the Scotland one into that as well, that actually there's fundamentals that are, that are much more important that they're getting wrong than just who's going to play 10 and, and what those headlines are about. You know, everyone's been clamouring for Smith to play and he was pretty good, but actually, ultimately, there are issues around the English rugby. I think what I witnessed, and I think maybe to a point in the Scotland, you take that Van der Merwe try was just, the physicality that, that the French showed. I mean, go, go back to the years gone by. You always want to think back to 03 when, you know, it rained on the, in, 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 uh, in Australia and the French were playing English in the semi I know it's a long time ago, but the joy was always going to beat them up. And I think the physicality aspect of England was really lacking. And I think when you get to that level of, 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 of rugby, where it is so combative, where it is absolutely all about the game line, England got destroyed. And you know, just watch the, the Flamont try where he just takes the ball in the game and carries, you know, a couple of boys over. And, and I think England just really struggled to get into the game. They looked shell shocked. They looked like they'd never really recovered from that, from that early start. And when you talk about the physicality, is that the individual players or is it the tactics or is it a combination? I think it's probably just just the a little bit of probably the, the, where, where are your leaders in the team? So who's going to stand up and, and fight a little bit? And then you look across that board and you get told they're leaders, but you know, Genji, but without Farrell on there, who was probably a guy that everyone leans on, has done historically. He wasn't there. You know, Genji's having his first game. I told you potentially wasn't as uh, as powerful and, and as, as inspiring as he has been in the past. And suddenly then you're looking around, and you're looking for the likes of Don Brandt to, to lead you and, and maybe Lawrence. And, and when they're not, when they're not actually being able, able to get in the game and they're struggling to win that. And I don't think it's tactics. I just think this is, there was that aura around that French team created probably by that, that desire when it rains, knowing they've got a fantastic defensive coach, knowing that, they're probably, they are the better side and their favourites to win that game. But when the rain came down, you know, you looked at thought, well, actually, if they can hang on in here, they've got a chance. But they didn't. They actually got blown away. And I think, you know, I was very lucky to play with a few of those boys uh, to lose. Ramos is the front. There's a couple of guys, well, all the guys actually start the front row. And you know when their tails are up and they're going, especially Marshall and by, they're going to be fantastic. And I think that, just, that showed on the weekend. It's quite weird when you unpick or you go after the powerful characters. So, so I... Like coming from a small country with a tiny player base, 
I'm like, I cannot fathom how English rugby could also say we don't have the powerful runners. You have so many players to pick from. Statistically, you've got some of the best in Europe in every different facet of the game. Um, when I look at it from the outside, I see a lack of organization and structure, which makes you look way weaker and way more dynamic than you should be. So like, I, I think it's deeper in that Borthwick's only have, what, two weeks, two and a half weeks to prep aside. They're all looking at each other thinking, boys, what are we doing here? What are our regen plays? How do we turn slow ball into quick ball? How do we boss a gain line? There's no fluidity to anything that they do at all in that they look lost. And when you come up against a side that's been together for two years, that has a great attack coach that can smash a gain line, you get blown away. Um, so there's a part of me that, when you see wider media and people talking about the depth of English rugby and are we in crisis, I don't think they are because you still produce a ton of players and a ton of talented players. I just don't think this group right now has had any time together and they've lost. The other weird thing is that you'll be in sides like this as well, Toby. When you are poorly coached or you don't have that clarity or certainty, everything goes to shit. But you can't stand up and say, we don't know what's going on uh, and we're lost because you just look like a Muppet. So like the only thing they can hope for this weekend is like an emotional reaction, like a knee jerk. What can I get? Like Genji, get the ball in your hands and go forward. But I've played inside that. There's only so far that goes in that you come up against one big collision and you get knocked on your arse and then, all right, well now what do we do? But every single other area of the game, whether it was scrum, whether it was mall, whether it was kicking contest or kicking to grass, France, beasted England in every single area. And that was the really worrying bit for me for England was what are they doing? Because they honestly look clueless. And that's where I kind of that, that's where I, I find a bit of hope in it is because everyone was sitting there going, well, the big headline stuff is Farrell and Smith. And actually it wasn't. And it it's just irrelevant. Shows, exactly. And I think it's been joyous, right? Because you watch, you know, as they call themselves the hacks, like, oh, that's right, column inches and talk about this and for hours. Actually, you hit the nail on the head. There was there's something just both it hasn't had enough time. Fundamentally, the English rugby, not player-wise, as I think you're right, there's a talent there. But well, there's a couple of bits in this one. So there's a talent there. Within that framework, absolutely, there are world-class players. But there's players who are who don't look world-class at the moment because they're not in a decent framework and agree with that. And then you go back to the decision to the RFU of, to remove Eddie Jones and bring both again. I mean, who wants to take that with eight games to go and then try and change and turn around the... the, the the oil tanker that it is English rugby, but you've gone down that path for sort of five or six years. So I agree with you. I think there's sort of a bit of confusion in that environment. That absolutely is that player debt, but I couldn't agree more. When you're sort of a bit lost and unaware of what's happening around you, then a good player can become a bad player very, very quickly. So we're both agreeing with Sir Clive Woodward. It's Eddie's fault. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, listen, all I want in life is to see Clive and Eddie go into a ring and just have it out. <laughs> Two minutes, all I want. I don't really, I don't know both of them very well. I know bits and pieces, but what a lovely white collar boxing that would be, be, wouldn't it? I mean, the amount of money they'd raise if they went and they had a good scrap. I mean, I know who my money's on, but it'd be still great to watch. <laughs> it'd sell twicking them out, wouldn't it? It would, yeah. Who's your money on a why? Come on, give us well, the little... I mean, Eddie's, Eddie's winning that all over. I mean, because he's horrible, <laughs> right? He's a nasty little... I mean, the stories you've heard about Eddie, I reckon he'd, he'd, probably, he'd probably get, um, he'd get to... To climb on the way in, right on the on the ring walk, we just give him a little jab in the back and punch the kid to show it be gone. Yeah, so it'd be a good one. On you mentioned it there. Speaking of battles, as a former fly half, I know it was arguably nothing to do with Marcus Smith, but certainly very little to do do with him. The defeat mm. of the weekend, it was all up front. But what do you make of the Smith, Farrell, and George Ford as well? And all three of them are in the thirty that are preparing for the Ireland game. Mm. Does Borthwick need to? quickly work out who his first choice is and just back them to the World Cup? Or is he able to kind of mix and match a bit? I, I, I think you're going to get a bit of a wishy-washy answer because I think at fly off, you're not going to be able to do much until actually those sort of the core principles are in place that, that Johnny talked about. And, and I don't think there's one head and shoulders above each other. I think his, probably his hope was when he went to Farrell and dropped Smith that Farrell was going to play so well. But Farrell was carrying the weight, the, you know, the weight of the world on his shoulders, right? He's having his England captain... Everyone's looking for him. He's leading. He's one of the constants in the last five or six years. His goal kicking is struggling. When your goal kicking goes, it's a real sign that something else is happening off the field and all that sort of stuff because you're worrying about all the, the context. He's spending so much time and then you're overthinking it. So he almost is a bit of a barometer to where England are. So going back to that fly half situation, I don't think there is a standalone time. I think had George been fit, I think Steve may have gone down that route because he knows him intimately, he loves him, he likes the way he carries himself and the way he operates. He's a fantastic reader 
and Eda sort of exploits the weaknesses in, in other teams. And I think he probably had been fit. He'd have been his um, Borthwick's number one choice. But and then probably that Farrell's um, forward axis comes back into play. But actually, at this moment in time, with George not having that much game time, with it being with you kind of sort of flipping massively uh, and turning around and going, actually, no, I'm all over Smith. It just sends a little bit of a weird signal out to us, but also within camp, actually, what, what, what are we doing here? Like, what are our structures? Why are we changing from a really pragmatic fly half to one that is seen as a bit more of an, an elusive ex- expert, like a guy who just creates space for others? So it, it was the one thing, and I had a friend of mine who, who uh, is actually a Toulousean, I mean, he was having a fun time during the game, right? I, I will pick up my phone half a Shock. Like 55. Yeah, like 55 <laughs> best. Uh, here we go. The one thing he said, it was, it just resonated. It's like, why would you play? Why would you play Smith? Why would you play a game which is fast and loose against against boys? And the core of that team is a Toulouse team. Like, what are you doing? They didn't want to. And he was dead right. So I think from my point of view, it just feels there's a bit of lack of clarity within the England camp at the moment. As you say, they've got the players, but have they... And it, and it's nothing to say, Steve. The coaches are going to be good, right? They are good, good coaches. But it's just that sort of transition period from Eddie to, to Steve. It's had three games, four games, and it's still a massive learning curve for those players in that environment. So tell us why they're going to be good coaches. You obviously played with Steve. He's won the Premiership final. Can you give us a bit on like his personality? He's not known as the biggest motivator, but massive on his detail. He's been chosen by the RFU to lead the side from now. What are people going to see? What can we expect? Global rugby fans that didn't watch Leicester. What will this England side look like over the next 24 months or, or near the time of the World Cup? It's hard to give you much information on Steve's personality because I'm not sure he's got a mask, you know. Because he doesn't have one. <laughs> <laughs> you got them. I don't want to say it. That's yours now. That's yours on that one. Um, yeah, so Steve isn't like the most charismatic guy in the world, but what he is is massively pragmatic and, and really well organised and works unbelievably hard. You speak to the guy that left, you know, He's that sort of any mould up at 4 a.m. and work. And he's very he's very statistically driven. Like he loves his data. He loves his stats. There are some five or six massive areas that he will look at um, statistically. And if they win four of those five, they should win the game. Right? That's how he operates. So, and around that, then you've got you've got Kevin, who you speak to anyone who's worked with him. You know, he's he's, he's in that short Edwards mould in terms of motivation. He's very different. You know, Edwards is a sort of a bit more stick. Whereas actually, Kevin, from what I understand, is is about relationships and great gaining trust and building those people. So where you are suffering in defence, you're willing to go down into that deep hole for, for your mate. Um, and that, that those two then work really well together because you've got maybe a guy who's a bit more standoffish and then you've got the guy who is going to put your arm around you. And they're both very you know, highly intelligent uh, rugby coaches. Going forward, um, you know, Wiggs coming in, uh, Richard Wiggles, we're sorry. Uh, and I think he, you know, he again is probably a bit of a mediator too, but you speak to the guys at Leicester, they love him, they love the way he operates, very, very knowledgeable about the game, having played, you know, he's like, he's like what, 55 and he's still playing Premiership rugby, you know, he's unbelievably learned, learned. So I think from my point of view, that dynamic is going to work well, but what you want to do, I think, is probably come out, come into a, a system and learn with the World Cup or something, if you, I, I, probably, I know, I, I know international rugby is quick, you know, you get Six Nations, Autumn Six Nations, you know, it's, it's going to come around, but actually, you don't want the pressure of the World Cup and especially a World Cup where you are literally, in, you know, going across the channel and having that confrontation with a, 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 a country that potentially is going to really be very joyful if England lose and, and go out early, right? So I think the pressure in that environment is very high and it's, it hasn't given them a nice soft landing and you're not going to get one at international rugby because it is, it is pretty cutthroat, but you are going to, probably wanting to have a better integration of your knowledge into that environment than you've had at the moment. And as well as Wigglesworth coming in, obviously, Alad Walters, he won the World Cup with right. South Africa, key part of the puzzle coming in as well. Finally, on England, before we move on to France, because we want to talk about the positives as well, what can they change this week? What would you change in terms of personnel-wise? And do you give them any chance of stopping Ireland? Win a Grand Slam? I don't think you can change a huge amount. You're not going to do much. You, you might have a few, as Johnny, as you know, you'll do a few t- tactical things. You might move things around a little bit, but not greatly. The core structure will still be there. What you're hoping for is that emotional kickback a little bit. And what you are kind of hoping to move that, from my point of view, is the one thing you don't do is, in a Grand Slam game is, is, is give it up easy. Um, and I think historically, whenever teams have gone to play a Grand Slam match, it's been pretty tight. It's been pretty, pretty gritty. Um, and I think that's what you want. You want that sort of emotional reaction. You want that bite back in the, in that in that England side. And they've got absolutely nothing to lose, right? 
that you know you saw Ireland were a bit clunky and they normally and it normally is that second last game for a Grand Slam but they were a bit clunky they've got a few injuries there's an opportunity to to, to exploit that and I think you've just got to go there with absolutely nothing. and that underdog feeling I think they're going to have on St Paddy's Day to to ruin someone's party is pretty special so you know they'll go and give it a go I'm not expecting massive fireworks it'd be fantastic to see that if they're still in the game with 60 to go how nervous Ireland become and if they can do that then I think they've got an opportunity if they get blown away as they did against France in the first 15 20 minutes then it could be a really, really tough day. It is incredible that we're at a stage with an England side, this is what we're talking about, that you're essentially saying go away from home, have a really minimalist game plan, and when you've got the ball, run really hard. That, that's essentially what we're saying is like emotionally mm. try and batter you into a game because there's nothing else there. And I just, I can't remember ever seeing in my memory another England side like that. Like, mm. not from, It's absolutely bonkers. Bring Manu in and give him the ball, eh? Well, yeah, I think that's it. I think that's it. And I, I, I think Manny will probably play, you know, maybe. I, well, I'll say probably, probably play maybe. Uh, but I think he should do with Lawrence and what he's created. And that's a real shame for him. But but you are going to have to. And I, and I think, you know, Ireland are flying. Right? I mean, Ireland are, are, are playing brilliant rugby. They're coached really well. You know, again, Farrell, ex- exceptional coach, understands the game really, really well with Kat around him. And I think that that Ireland just got a structure and the, the sort of form in place that you can slot anyone in, right? And that's, and goes as he goes to Johnny's point before about not quite knowing what you're doing. Irish rugby at this moment in time, you can just drop someone in and off they go. Whereas I think in English rugby, there'd be a huge amount of catch up from that individual. And, and I think that's the big, big difference between the two sides at the moment. Right, enough talking about England <laughs> and all that rubbish. You were at the game. What impressed you most about that French performance? Well, I sort of touched on it, but it was that physical side of it, right? I mean, yeah, the French have always had a big pack, but it, but I think England have always matched them and, and, and big countries have always matched them, the sort of the, the South Africans and, and the Australians to a point. And I just thought England were just on the back foot for the rest, for the whole game. And Flamont was incredible. Bayern, uh, Bayern and, and, uh, and Marshall were, again, were usual. So I was actually sort of consciously thinking, well, Alder Geary's in there. He's like third or fourth choice, right? He's not right. that good. And he tore him apart. And I'm like, oh, man, that's all. And I, I played with him. And I remember thinking, God, he's sticking the game. He's not the fittest bloke in the world. He'll really start struggling, right? But but you, you know, can scrum. You can scrum. You can scrum, right? And he was just calling carnage. I was like, oh, mate, you're not sticking to script. Uh, and they were just great. And then I think you've got that lovely actor. I know we all talk about Dupont and what a player it is. And he is phenomenal. But sitting behind that pack, he's going to look so, so good. And Untermack was great. And look, I think you can list off the whole the whole team. My joyous thing is, is I got a little... I spent two years with Thomas Ramos and he is just so good at the moment. A guy that was... Put out on loan, came back in, worked incredibly hard as kicking. But he, at this moment in time, is is such an integral part of that French side, and he gets the game really well. He understands what's happening, and he's probably not one of the superstars, right? You've got probably about five or six names ahead of him, but he just is the the character I think who's flourishing and showing how good France are because he is is, is a as a player, I suppose, that sits in the background a little bit, but now it's just come to the fore and it's been brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And to add to that as well, at the start of this season, we didn't know how much we were going to even see him at Toulouse. Because mm. they signed Melvin Jaminet, came from Perpignan. Everyone thought, well, he's going to be the next starter. Then Ange Capuazzo came as well. So yeah. two fullbacks signed, and you thought, oh, Jesus, Tom Ramos going to get that game time. Um, right. He was phenomenal, and he has been all season for Toulouse. I wanted to ask you again, Antoine Dupont, ex-teammate of mine, the kicking game, the ability to kick off his left and his right. I think he found grass in the backfield more than 10 times. I think it was 13 times he found space and found ground, which is criminal, but... How good is that to have an arm like that in your side and a kicking option like that? It's free. I can't think of another nine or another halfback on the planet, but how big a difference does that make? Massive. I think it makes a big difference for a couple of reasons. You say he finds the grass there because England are getting beaten up so, and they're worried about the front of the French ascendancy. So, so their wingers are a bit flatter. They're exposing their backfield a little bit. And so they can, he can find grass a lot with Stewart having to cover a lot of space. I thought they exploited Stewart as well in terms of his his speed across the ground because it England were under so much pressure. But the, the speed of thought that he has is, is remarkable. He's unbelievably strong. I think he's sort of he's sort of the, the character you can build everyone around. And, and for me, I think as a 10, when you've got a guy who can see the game as well as that, it just gives you the luxury, right? And also four guys are watching him all the time. You know, two guys next to Rook and one and out are always spending their time. So you've basically got three two couple of guys in the Rook, Two guys, or well, four guys consumed. You've got six guys maybe just taken uh, away by by him and, and taking that time away. And so for the 10, it's, it's a luxury. And then, I don't know, I think he he is just setting standards across the board at the moment, this moment in time. And he is, I mean, I fear for France if he gets injured. I mean, it, there might be a few, you know, a few sort of 
or was it South Africa? Was it 95 where they poisoned the All Blacks before the final? There'll be a lot of that going <laughs> yeah. on from opposition teams. <laughs> a lot of poison at this World Cup, is there? Is that <laughs> exactly. That's the only hope some teams have got, right, if they go well. But I think that's it. Uh, allegedly, that was, right? I didn't say that out loud. Um, but, um, <laughs> but I think that's the, the point. I think he's just so good and he gives everyone around such confidence. And I always remember like, watching him at Toulouse. Obviously, you play with him class, but when he has signed, the ball spits out and he somehow buys time for everyone. Like he runs around and he sort of hands off two people. He looks for an option, drops it off. And he's sort of, everyone's so fearful of him. He's so, so good. Um, it was a bit like watching you play, Floody. It's the same type of... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, in fast forward, right? Um, but yeah, I think the thing for me was, as a 10, it was, it's a joy. And I, I was lucky to have, you know, Ben Youngs when I was at Leicester. And, and he did that, the similar sort of stuff when he was flying, when, when Ben was sort of this young 21, 22 year old, like, teams are terrified of him and, and as, as a fly half you you just have that rapport with that player and you can just sit there and, and, and sort of articulate what you want to happen it's great another man who famously went for the odd kick with his wrong foot you played with one of the very few global superstars i guess we've had in world rugby johnny wilkinson for club and country obviously antoine dupont is now being spoken about in those terms is he there already or is he well on his way there and do you see similarities between Dupont and Wilkinson? I know they're different positions, but whether it's personality, the way they influence games? I think certainly in terms of personality and the way they influence games, I think they're both highly driven and motivated and they look after themselves incredibly well. Their skill set is, is is highly impressive. I think Johnny probably was a a, a, a grafter that more than most in terms of how hard he worked fitness-wise, uh, look, studying games, working on his technique, kicking everything. He covered everything, right? And he was a, he was probably a bit of a warrior too. And that was probably part of his, what made him great because he was so conscious of what may go wrong that he wants to cover all bases uh, for everyone on the field and also for himself off it. Whereas I, I don't know Antoine's personality that well, but from what I understand, he's pretty a bit more relaxed and he's a bit sort of calmer, but he's a massive student of the game. And, and physically, I think he's probably more gifted than, than most rugby players. Um, and that's where what sets them alight. You know, if you that weird combination of, of someone who gets all the natural talent in the world and also grafts really hard, then suddenly they become very good players, right? And I think that's where he finds himself. So he's able then to sort of stamp his authority on games and, and really control and dictate. And, and Johnny knows as well as I do that in France, the, the, the nine is the controller of everything, right? And, and that's where he becomes so important to the French sides and the teams he plays at because at 10, in the UK, you're probably a bit more controlling. You get to sort of make a lot of calls, whereas in, in France, it's very much more driven towards the nine and, and there and how integral they are to the performance of the side. And, and he's flourishing in that environment. And Alex King, Johnny, compared him to Dan Carter this week. So maybe that's a more accurate comparison, slightly more relaxed than Johnny, but still a global superstar nonetheless. Yeah, a global superstar. I think when you compare directly, though, there's one thing that's glaringly missing, and that's a Webb Ellis trophy. And that these boys, Dan Carter, Johnny Wilkinson, have lifted it. Antoine has yet to do that. So to be in that bracket, certainly as an individual, um, the X factor, the ability to beat a man, the physicality, the kicking game, the vision, the touch, everything is there. For me, clearly, he's the best player on the planet at the minute. But to get that long standing in that bracket, to be in the same terms, he has to go and win the competition. So that is going to be a test for him and the team later this year. But look, in terms of influence, in terms of enjoyment, he gives wider rugby public. The pleasure you get watching him on the field, he's absolutely phenomenal. So for me, clearly the best player in the world right now um, and a big year coming up for him and his team. And Toby, you played with Gail Fico as well, who is obviously mm. the defensive captain and leader under Sean Edwards. What was he like back when you were playing with him and how has he kind of developed since then? I think if you told me Gail Fico would be defensive leader of any side, I would start laughing like he loved, he loved doing one thing and that was the one thing only and then would hang about in defence and do a little bit I, I, unbelievably strong and make his tackles don't be wrong but he wasn't he wasn't there for that right he was he was a guy who was playing in a Toulouse team such a lovely bloke first and foremost really cared but I think him I think Sean coming in and, and, and recognising that the French weakness was defence that they were sort of in there a little bit for it and they'll hang around and actually changing it a bit so lads if you want to go play rugby here's how we get the ball back and we get it back really quickly and we give that loads of enthusiasm and then actually get to attack more than you want, you need to, right? You don't have to defend 20 phases just soaking up people. You've got to get the ball back. And Gail, I think, has taken that on and has been phenomenal in that regard. And I think it's transformed his game. I remember playing him in his first ever, I think his first ever start or first ever European game 
at 18 years old, Leicester played and he scored a try and he was, you know, again, amazing. But you could see defensively, he was young, but over that time, he hasn't necessarily developed. I think this the acceleration in his game now is massive and it is down to Sean, just giving him that that leadership role and just giving him the, the knowledge to how to understand how to put himself in certain places. And now I think he's he's probably as important as anyone else in that team because of what goes to him and, and how much control he has. Do you think it'd be fair to say that he represents the evolution of this French team in that we both played against him, you played with him in the top 14 and almost the, the revelation in the league as well and how it's changed the top 14 itself. If you watch it now, the product's definitely changed. But there's a guy that was identified by Sean Edwards, as you mentioned, young, talented, gifted, probably hadn't been coached on that side of the ball. But the difference he's made, you see John Dante coming in next to him, the difference they all make defensively mm. now makes this French side a completely different proposition. Yeah, I think absolutely. I think that was always the case, right? It was it was almost like Kevin Keegan era of Newcastle United, right? So the France are going to grow out and they were going to score. Glory five. days. Glory yeah, days. I, just, I had to get Newcastle United. Thinking. So, like, you know, <laughs> it's going to get better. Don't worry. Um, and so, so I think you had to, I think it was almost like you were there going to score 30, but, but they let in 30, right? There was like, there was a bit of sort of nonchalance really about defence. Whereas I think having those structures in place and probably, as you say, having a defensive coach, because lots of French coaches, pay a bit of lip service to the fence, but the tax stuff is where they, they love it, right? They love the, and that. That's what French rugby is renowned for. But if you have that that hard-nosed rugby league environment about you, that you get the ball back, you're brutal, and you're, you're then that gives you opportunity for the Cyril Bay to get over the ball and, and the Marshalls to get over the ball. Suddenly, you are you are a team that becomes very dangerous. And I think you're dead right. He has almost epitomised the evolution of, of the French international game, certainly, because... He's somebody now that you've gone, geez, if he can defend and attack, we're in a lot of trouble here. And, and, and I think that's kind of what the French team are at the moment. You mentioned the likes of Ramos, Aldegheri, Bay, Marchand. I think you probably played with Francois Cross as well. Oh, yeah. All guys that were at Toulouse when you were there. At that time, obviously, they were most of them were very young. Was it kind of obvious that any of those were going to become absolute superstars or not really? Yeah, very, very obvious. I remember sitting down with uh, after a training session with Ald- with the, the front three that played on the weekend and just almost like, you know, as an old boy, I wasn't that old, I was maybe like 30, but just being like, lads, you know how good you are? Like, like maybe stop doing some stuff off the field. Like, you're going to be so good. You know what I mean? And they're like, they're having a cigarette to piss off. Having a <laughs> but lads, but seriously, you'll be really good. Like, we can swap places if you want. And you, you recognise it. And Francois, I think, deserves it he again is a guy who works so so hard he was always very driven like under i think under 18s and 20s captain really really driven um very good very conscientious of who he was but probably doesn't have the most amount of natural talent but has just grafted his way into that side and become really important um and i think you could definitely see those guys were going to be pretty special um obviously gail was there at the time as well and and it just felt like that next generation was coming it's almost like you were stood there when I was at Toulouse for those three years watching it happen. You know, you're watching the Douce Etoise and Yangers sort of leave. Um, and then you're watching this next crop come through. And I think their acceleration has been really important. I, I mean, in my naivety, I probably don't know how old they are now. I don't want to know how old they are. They're like 26, 27. But when they were there <laughs> early on, it was like you could see that they were going to be pretty, pretty special. It was just when it was going to happen. Um, and I think the confidence they've got as well from Toulouse how they're playing, how you know them winning European championships and, and top fourteen titles has just given them a load of a, a massive amount of energy. And then the likes of Dupont and Untermat coming through is you know it's pretty special. That place. We'll clip that bit up and just share it far and wide that Toby Flood was responsible for them all giving up smoking and their attitude <laughs> yeah, change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think I'll definitely, I'll definitely remember that conversation where they were like, "God, this English guy, his French is really bad. He's sort of pissed me off." But uh, yeah, that's, that's, so that's... boring. Why doesn't he <laughs> smoke? Why doesn't, doesn't he, he smoke? Doesn't he smoke yeah, exactly. Why was it? Why is he not doing MDMA in the change? And what weird? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and mate, like generally, completely different. We talk about the culture shock and coming over, but. Those three years you had in Toulouse, how do you look back generally, the friendships, the sort of playing group, the, the, the mates that you made, and also just the town and the place, the south of France, how much did you enjoy it? Oh, I absolutely loved it. I mean, it was it was really difficult, don't worry, like coming across, learning a new language, you were so fatigued at the end of every day, you're standing there looking at people's mouths. But I love the experience of of of, of just what what it was about. I mean, there were some definitely some really tough times. Uh, rugby was just so different. I went from probably one of the most structured environments in, in the UK to probably one of the loosest, and that was quite difficult to deal with. There'd be issues in terms of, like, I'd say, call a move and a guy would just run off, and I'd be like, whoa, 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 what a minute, what's going on? But the town, the people, 
how much rugby means to them is, is was amazing and I absolutely loved it. Um, and I think it was one of those times in life where, you know, going forward when you do whatever you end up doing, you may not get that opportunity again. It was the only way I could wear it up that I was going to get, you know, the chance to go and play abroad, challenge myself. And I think, you know, I became a better player for it because I think I became a bit more relaxed, a bit more sort of conscientious about other ways to perform, other ways to act. And I think that for me was was a tough learning curve, but absolutely thrived it in terms of what I took out of it and how I sort of, I guess, kind of changed my style a bit of approach to certain sort of aspects of the game. And you spent a season under Guy Novas, I think, and a couple under Hugo Moller. So mm. how did you find them? Were they similar or very different to work with? Very, Both very, very passionate. Guy was sort of, uh, a guy I, I knew, knew, knew for a short time, but was you know you basically it was they were sort of they are kind of director of rugby I guess and certainly Guy was Guy was sort of a, a watcher of rugby and a, a very high motivator. You spoke to a few guys there that Guy would maybe not come in and do much work on the field. He would leave that to the coaches, but but the, but he then would motivate the guys really well. They all talked about a guy I think when they went to play Claremont in the final. That long story, but Claremont bought a sword right to the game and the sword apparently is some sort of ceremonial sword to show that they've won and, and Guy saw it whether he did or not who knows but he then goes into the change for five minutes for kick off and he starts telling them how this team already won it because they bought their sword they, they were preparing the show, all this sort of stuff and it just got as the French do right they were, they were mental they were like, how did the level of disrespect from Claremont all that sort of stuff and they, like, they battered them so he was they was very good at working out how to motivate the individual and what was needed to be said very good at that and then Ugo came in. Ugo, sorry, came in, and he was, he was, he was very different, very emotional. He had a quite a turbulent time as well because we, I think, there was sort of a change in the guard and the president and all that sort of stuff. And you, that is so important at Toulouse in terms of who takes that role and the politics that go around it. So he had a bit of a turbulent sort of eighteen months, held onto his place, I think, uh, and rightly so. And then has flourished massively in that environment. And very different characters. Ugo, much more hands on on the field, wants to be in, 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 sort of involved. Both love a shout, but all French coaches do. Um, and, and that was kind of it, really. But uh, yeah, both both sort of, I mean, Ugo's, if he keeps that team around, around him, it's going to be, um, he's going to have a good few years going forward to be all right. And mate, he's done really, like, you look at how simply they play the structures. They're just so hard to beat because of the quality of player. Um, I always like asking this, the loosest that you came across in France, the loosest thing that you saw, the loosest thing, whether it was a night out, whether it was in-game, you talked about, people leaving after a call or you've talked about swords, you talked about smoking, but the loosest thing that you came across in those three years? Uh, on the field, and I'm not going to name him because he's such a good guy, but basically we were doing a fitness session and uh, and, it was like, well, and he ba- he just lost his head at something to the coach. Don't remember what it was. Such a, you know, It was a back and he just just took his boob off, threw it on the floor and just walked in. And I was like, if that had happened at Leicester, like there's no way you're coming back from that. And then like P P45 time. That's what that is. <laughs> yeah, massive P45 time. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. And he just went, screw this, and just walked off the field, right? And then I mean the the the, the boys would 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 socialize and they were pretty good at it. And I think the the, the I, I mean I could never do this. I'm not good enough, but would be to get to the market in the morning. So they go on a Saturday night and roll through and then have one of their their so third beer. Yeah, I mean, and it's a, what I love about French markets is they serve beer and wine at like 7 a.m., right? So these boys are there having some oysters, having a beer, doing whatever. They were quite loose. So those, those boys, there were some loose boys, but I think that was part of it as well. I think at Toulouse, it, it, it gives you that space to go and be like that. They're going out on a Saturday night and then Sunday morning at the market. Is that very similar to your current life? Because you're at university, aren't you? And you're <laughs> yeah, doing exactly, an MBA? Yeah. Very, yeah, doing the MBA. You're very similar. Uh, no, I've sort of, I'm sadly one of those ones where I'm a part-time student, right? So I'm, I'm supposed to be that sensible one. Uh, but yeah, I'm sort of doing the MBA, um, which is good, and then just trying to push it forward and go from there. So yeah, it's all right. But yeah, the, I think the the students have a good time, right? I mean, they probably get stuck into it, and it's it's quite the rugby boys are really good. But I think that's the same for everything. I think we've got a couple of older pros who've come back to play, and what I've enjoyed about it is it's sort of that rawness again. You sort of rugby. You know, Matt Simmons has come to join us at Cambridge, and and he talked about the other day where it's great to be back in an environment where all they want to do is socialize and have fun and create. Cause I think rugby can become a bit of a job and a bit of commerce when you're playing it, you can because they're immersed in it and you sort of see the bad parts of it. Whereas actually these boys are just doing it for the love of it. And it's, it's fantastic. I absolutely, absolutely love it. I love it. The mature student never thought I'd be that yeah. guy. I've been there as well. It's a strange place. <laughs> it's a very strange place. Um, and you've done a bit of coaching as well. 
You're mm. doing a bit up in Newcastle. So once this MBA is done, is that the aim? Is it to get into full-time coaching? Or have you got something else that you'd like to move into? No, I think sort of moving into the corporate world, I think is what I want to do. I did a year of coaching, loved it. Um, really, really enjoyed working with the boys. Uh, but the only way I could sort of look at it is, is it's, a, it's a ruthless game. Or it's becoming quite a ruthless game now, right, in terms of chopping and changing. Look at Eddie Jones going, but also just as a transient nature. I, and I sort of want to base the family somewhere. So we've just decided, and I'm rightly so, to go into the corporate world and, and, and work, explore that sort of stuff. And Varsity game coming up next weekend at, at Twickenham. You mm. played in it last year. This year, you broke your ankle, am I right in saying? Yeah, fraction dislocated my ankle playing in uh, late November. So pretty nasty one, laying on a hospital bed, sort of going, mm, was that worth it? Uh, and it was, like, I absolutely loved it. <laughs> but it, can I get back? No. I like, <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. At that moment, I'm probably not worth it. Uh, but going forward, you know, I, I loved every part of that, that of the club that I'm sort of part of. So, yeah, uh, Varsity's on the 25th of March, which should be a, a, a good one. Uh, both teams have, in fact, we've got our, our last game tonight. Uh, so I'm heading up to Cambridge tonight. And then we sort of slowly prep towards Varsity and build up. But it's it's a pretty special day. The guys, uh, you know, uh, there's lots of sort of ceremony around, but a lot of stuff, it's great. And I think, you know, it means a huge amount to those guys to roll out to them and have a game against, you know, the other place because for them, it's, 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 a, it's, it's, it's sort of the... the the climax of their season, right? It's it's the weirdest season. It's, it's like the longest. It is the longest preseason because you could lose every game and beat, win that game on on the varsity, and suddenly you had a great year. So world champion, it, world champions, exactly, win that exactly. game. So so it's huge. I absolutely love it, and I think you know you just got to manage that emotion because you can sort of play the game in your head over and over again. But yeah, I played last year's varsity, which was a tough experience. We got a red card early on, and we're always up against it. Whereas this year, I think. Um, you know, hopefully if we keep 15 on the field, we've, we've got a good chance and, and so of the other place, right? So it's, um, it should be a good one. I'm looking forward to it. Bloody, I realise you've got two minutes till you need to get in the car. So I'm going to ask you for this week's predictions, mate. <laughs> mate. Ireland, Jeez, England. <laughs> Ireland, Ireland, England. How is that one going to go? Uh, honest, honest, honestly. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, uh, yeah, Ireland, I think, have to win that. I have two favourites. And I think if Ireland, if Ireland, if Ireland, are away from England in the first 15, 20, then I think England really, really strong because you don't, I don't think they've got the capability to chase the game with the confidence levels they have. So I think Ireland by 15 to 20, I think pretty comfortably. 15 tries. Okay. And the next one, <laughs> France, France against Wales. I mean, you can't look past France, can you? They should, they should win that really easily. Wales have flattened the sea this tournament, beaten it the and France will walk over them, I think, very quick, very easily. And the big one, uh, Scotland and Italy. I mean, Italy should win that. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Italy should win that. Gonna, they've got to win one game, right? Um, I've got a weird feeling about Italy. I'll be wrong, but I mean, Scotland should should win. But Mate, they, they don't them. have they don't have Finn Russell or Stuart Hogg. Yeah, and Italy big. have looked dangerous. And if they yeah. just were a bit more pragmatic in that first period against Wales, you never know. But. Uh, I'll go with Italy on that one. Just, ah, to, just yes. to annoy you a little bit. I'll be wrong, but just to, just to annoy you. Thanks so much for joining us, Toby, giving us your insight. And good luck with the end of the NBA, moving into the corporate world. And on that note, I'm sure you'll see Johnny in many more corporate hospitality suites in the near future. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, exactly. suits. Horrible suits. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Cheers, Toby. Thanks a lot, mate. Anytime. See you soon. Cheers, boys. Good insight from Toby there. And doing an MBA at Cambridge. So he's obviously a clever guy. Mate, he's a smart boy, um, but he's also great fun as well. So great to have him on. I know he looks back on his time in Toulouse really fondly. Um, but yeah, he's just a good egg. I'm not like, obviously comes across, like speaks really well, smart man. Um, when he says the word corporate, it sounds horrible. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> You're Maybe in that world, Johnny. <laughs> Maybe with the corporate world, well, don't do it, mate. It, it sounds stinking. Um, but yeah, great to have him on. Great to have his insight. Um, because he's done it all. Great bloke. So this weekend then, we chatted a little bit about France, but hardly anything. So Wales, they beat Italy. They did look better. But if the Italians had taken their chances, it could have been a completely different story. So what are you expecting in Paris? Do you know what? I'm expecting a closer game, bizarrely. Um, Wales will not be, even though England beat Wales, Wales cannot be as bad as England were last weekend. It is impossible. I, I, I just don't, which is bizarre because they have been poor in some of the opening games of this tournament, but I just I just can't see it happening. I know that France will want to put on a show. They'll want to finish on a high. They're still hoping to pip uh, Ireland to this tournament. They have to score a lot of points. 
but I just can't I can't see there being a 40 point points difference a clear win for France don't get me wrong absolute favorites and for good reason uh, but I think it'll be a little bit tighter like a margin of 15 20 points and Paul Willems is out another friend of the show Manny Miafu has been training with the squad Incredible. But... you see what Fabian's done there you see what <laughs> Fabian's done there come over here come see what this looks like this is what you could have you don't want to go to Australia it's miles away very smart and we've been chatting about this for ages with Manny um it can't be picked until December as far as we understand is it Roman Taufa-Vanua that comes straight in or some of the pictures from training in the early part of the week Charles Olivon has been training in the second row hasn't he well, Big Tower picked up a little bit of a knock, so I'm not sure if Olivon has just been training there because they don't have anyone else. Uh, but going back to Manny, like, amazing to see. And again, if you're looking, not for a stunt, but if you were looking to welcome somebody in further down the track, what better way to do it? Like, don't go and look elsewhere. We want you here. You're not even qualified yet. Just come and be part of our training sessions. Really smart by the French coaching staff. And I hope that Manny's loved the week as well to be involved with the boys. He obviously knows a packet of them from Toulouse, but um making friends with other guys will be massive and a big shot on the arm confidence wise that he's really wanted and he can fit into that environment so great for him um going back to this weekend Tao picked up a little bit of a knock Charles Olivon has been training in the second row but I think when it comes down to a match 15 and who you're picking they would probably start with Tao um in the second row and Charles Olivon would be starting in his, his back row position where he was phenomenal again at the weekend running and everything scoring tries smart it's running the line out um so yeah i reckon they'll start with the solidity that they like in the second row i've always known that fabian loves a big tight headlock uh, so that probably will be roman Taufifuna. and we spoke to manny we know he wants to play for france we also know he's been tapped up by eddie jones or the australian union tapped up if that's the wide world he's been a- a- approached the word is he's he said no people can always change their mind so you're right fabian a smart move to get him in and just say you're loved you're welcome in december you're ours so eddie he's already got one back i'm not sure if you saw the young clermont second roar yes so he's headed back to the water so like, there will be this the dangle of a carrot come back this is the contract you're back home um but manny's already said what he wants to do publicly um and it's the right choice. Like, I think if you want to be over here, longevity, your career, the family reasons, once you roll all of that into it, if you're happy over here and you want to stay, it's a great place to play rugby and to be part of the French national setup would be incredible. But obviously, he's had the phone call from Eddie, as with a few others, a couple of others headed back, but Manny's decided he's staying, which is cool. That's the second row. In the front row, we spoke about Dorian Aldegheri and what a good game he had. Does he keep his place or does Antonio come back in? Uh, so training on Tuesday, you had Antonio was in three. You also had Falatea was back in 18. So it looks Oof. like, I know, record win. Thanks for your time, but <laughs> on you go again. Um, but that's it. It looks like they want to stick with Antonio uh, and then have the mobility and the strength of Falatea off the bench. It was actually Makalu that had the seven on his back for training as well. So it's whether they keep um, Oliva on the second row or if he flicks back to back row, I would say probably back row. And then it was... Tau Finua coming back in with five on his back next to Thibaut Flamand, and it was Chalereau who was on the bench. So a few different permeations, but it looks like Antonio will be coming straight back in. And we chatted a little bit about it, but England travelling to Dublin, St. Patrick's weekend. What's your prediction? Uh, do you know what? For my Irish cousins, they've never won a Grand Slam in Dublin. True. It's always been away. So I hope for them that they get that celebration. Johnny Sexton will also probably get the points record for the competition with the first kick of the game. So watch out for that cheer as he beats Ronan O'Gara's record. Um, I don't know, mate. I, even though there will be a few key players missing for Ireland, I still think they could run up a bit of a score in England. If they keep going the way they're going, if they keep the ball in play, England have to be better. Um but definitely an Irish win and for them to lift the trophy and celebrate a Grand Slam in Dublin for the first time would be the first time, the first time in recent history for this crop of players uh, would be incredible. So I think it will be an Irish win. I think it will be comfortable as well. And I'm not sure what shots England can fire. Um, Floody talked about bringing back in Manu, a bit of physicality, a bit of edge, but once you get into multi-phase and you become lost, do they have the clarity 
to wear teams down. I'm not sure they do. So Irish win for me. And Toby said it, Italy to beat Scotland without Russell and Hogg, yeah? Oh. I, <laughs> do you know what? See, with Finn not being there and Hoggy not being there, um, I think we all saw the difference as well when Finn comes back into this. isn't to disrespect other 10s, but the difference he made when he came back into the team during the autumn. The same sort of effect that Johnny Sexton has on his side, even though the the functions and the strategy and the systems are the same, the level of execution, vision, and decision-making is different. Um, and so it makes it much harder. Italy as well, stuck. they were really poor against Wales. They can't be that poor again. Um, I think Scotland, <laughs> You're talking yourself into no, it. No, no, I, I think Scotland will win that, but I think it will be a very close game. I don't think that'll be one at a canter at all. And I think it'll probably be Scotland's most difficult game of the tournament with key personnel clashes. I'm looking forward to seeing... Blair Kinghorn. He at can't 15. start at fly half and full, but so. Mate, I, he's been, see, when he's come on the field, he's been great from 15 a wing. Uh, yeah. Big injection into the game, big, strong athlete. But for me, he isn't a 10. Uh, so I'll be looking forward to seeing who starts at 10 that isn't Blair and looking forward to Blair having a big impact from fullback, where I think he's fantastic. Um, but a big job to be done by the incoming standoff for Scotland because that will not be an easy game. Italy are good. And away from the international game, let's finish off with a bit of transfer gossip. We love it. What have you heard? So Jack Nowell, mm. I'm not sure what reports are back in the UK, but here widely reported in rugby media, already signed for La Rochelle. There's been no official communication from La Rochelle or from Jack, but that'd be a hell of a signing because he is a worldie. Um, Jack Willis rumoured to be staying in Toulouse, extending yeah. his contract, which would mean getting through the World Cup with England and then staying in La Ville Rose, Joshua Tuisova, who had already been announced to be joining Racing officially. He's already signed that pre-contract, but it looks like he might go back on his words. I don't know mm. if that's to stay at Lyon um, or to move to a different side. That type of thing has already happened. Uh, I remember Mamuka Gorgodzi from Montpellier days had signed a pre-contract with Breve, and then Moir Altrad had to buy out the pre-contract to keep him. That happened twice. He did that with Toulon as well. Um, so it's not completely uncommon, but it's costly for someone, either for Tuasova or for the club that wants to retain him or buy his contract. So a strange one. We don't often see that anymore because the figures we're talking about are massive. Uh, and the last one is Santi Cordero, so a friend of the show as well, Argentinian up in Bordeaux, rumoured to be heading to Perpignan next season as well. Another phenomenal player, and he'd fit right in down in Perpignan. Plenty more transfer news to talk about in the coming weeks, I'm sure, as well. Always, always. Thanks, Johnny. A big thanks to Toby for joining us as well. And thanks to all you guys for listening. Make sure you hit subscribe, leave us a nice review if you can, check us out on Rugby Pass and on YouTube, and we'll be back with another episode next week. Au revoir, Johnny. Cheers, mate. Bye.